Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And I'm thrilled to talk a little bit about this work. So as you said, I'm Gennady. I completed a lot of work with the Pachter Lab at Caltech. Um, and um, a lot of this work kind of uh, makes the most sense in the context of my background. The first thing to know about me is I'm a chemical engineer. I did a bachelor's in chemical engineering at Rice. Um, I worked for Edo Golding, which is responsible for my interest in stochastic uh, transcriptional modeling. Then I moved to Cal uh, moved on to Caltech for my PhD again in chemical engineering. Um, uh, later on in my uh, PhD career, I interned with Celsius Therapeutics, where I applied this theory and software to large patient data sets. And at the graduate level, and in the context of sequencing, uh, chemical engineering really involves um, kind of the unification of these basic themes. So theory, what kind of biological mechanisms actually contrive to um, generate our data? How should we model them? Computation, how can we solve these models? How can we put them into a computer and get a, a, get a number out? And uh, statistics, what can we hope to infer from models and data? So these are the three basic themes I'm going to be coming, um, uh, coming back to throughout this talk. Um, but the big picture uh, kind of foundation um, is going to have more to do with biology. So these foundations are going to seem basic, but I find it helpful to explicitly state them as we build toward quantitative details. The premise says follows. We want to understand biology in a general and abstract sense. And on the slide, you can see some general and abstract biology. And we start to do so by understanding living cells. And here we need to recall some time scales and uh, kind of causal chains. Cells live for a few hours to dozens of years, and they're ultimately controlled by DNA, which stays more or less the same throughout the entire lifetime. Now, DNA is split up into genes, and those encode proteins, those perform the cell's functions and live for days to months. The essential connection between the two is RNA, which only lives for a few minutes to a few hours and serves to transmit information from DNA to proteins. So RNA is transcribed and then proteins are translated. And um, which RNA are present controls which proteins are produced. This in turn determines the cell's function and structure and allows the cell to respond on shorter time scales. So when we talk about things like cell types, we're talking about precisely that function and structure. We look at hair follicle cells, they make hair proteins. We look at nerve cells, they produce neurotransmitters. Or in other words, this basic conceptual picture provides a foundation for axiomatizing what a cell type is. And even if we just focus on the first part of the process, the first half of the central dogma, um, the actual details rapidly become quite complicated. Even if the gene is characteristic to a particular cell type, its DNA is regulated. It's not always just on, it switches on and off. RNA is typically not used as is. Instead, typically a long gene is transcribed and then large portions are cut out. The DNA lives in the nucleus, which is an isolated compartment, but proteins are produced outside of it, so RNA needs to be moved outside. And finally, RNA is eventually degraded or destroyed. Um, and even adding on these details gives us a fairly, understand, a fairly elementary picture of biology, uh, but we're already beginning to appreciate that the details are quite complex. Now, my thesis work um, focuses essentially on RNA, essentially on the process on the slide, and this is a legitimate start. It tells us something about the cell's current priorities. There's a deeper and more immediate reason to care about RNA. We know a lot about DNA. It's a template for genes. It's fairly well understood. It's more or less the same in every cell and between different individuals. If we really want to learn um, kind of more intricate details, we can sequence it. It's inexpensive. We would like to learn about the details of individual cells' functions. And like I said, that has to do with what proteins the cells produce and how much. But we can't measure those at a single cell, single molecule level and for thousands of genes at a time. But we can measure RNA and um, 
the key concept here is that RNA can be reverse transcribed to DNA, then that DNA, technically the complementary DNA, can be sequenced using the same commercial solutions. So we get a series of reads that give the sequence content of the transcriptome. If we compare those sequences to the genes in the genome, we can figure out which genes the reads came from. Now, ostensibly, there's a lot more detail here. We have to isolate individual cells. We have to add chemical barcodes to identify distinct molecules and cells. And that's the general idea. Once we have this information, we can generate this big matrix of counts. Now, notice the caveat here. Um, it says mature RNA because typically we care about the RNA that's going to go on to um, immediately generate uh, proteins. It's the kind of the coding forms of the RNA. But we can get this data set. And over the past few years, there's been a tremendous amount of investment into this idea from academic and biotech labs. And this makes sense. It gives very large scale information that can be used for biological and therapeutic discovery. We can try to look at differences between healthy and pathological cells, try to attribute the pathology to something specific. And in practice, this looks as follows. People take this uh, large high dimensional data structure and summarize it and say pictures like this, each cell is a dot and the blobs are cell types. And this essentially illustrates the variability in a data set. And then they use these summaries to characterize or illustrate what's happening throughout a biological process. So the picture on the right is for instance about how immune cell gene expression changes in tumors, which tells us something about uh, why anti-tumor drugs work or don't. So with all of these prospects and with all of this investment, uh, we need some principled way to say whether this is reliable or not. And to begin to understand this, we have to start with the limitations of the experiment. If we were doing signal processing, uh, we would be talking about signal to noise ratios. Here, we're talking about the relationship between RNA and the observations, and we're not counting RNA inside the cell. We're counting molecules that happen to be converted to DNA and then sequenced. Not every single molecule is picked up. Making this more complicated, the process is random or probabilistic. We run it multiple times, we get different outcomes. Let's say we have seven molecules in the cell, as on the previous slide, and we pick up three on average. We can still get zero, we can still get seven, or any number in between. And to formalize this, we need to think of the process in terms of probabilities. So we introduce our first mathematical object, the probability of getting D molecules observed if there are really X molecules in the cell. Uh, in this case, it's a binomial distribution. And the implication here is that if we spend $10,000 on a sequencing experiment, we'd like to learn something about biology. We want to know the differences between cell types or um, disease states are because of a real difference in gene expression rather than incidental noise. So the first step of every analysis in one way or another is to try to reduce the noise by transforming or correcting the data in some way. And to understand the implications of this, we can use a different mathematical object, Bayes' theorem. In the last slide, we saw that the true number of biological molecules controls the number we observe. And we can invert this relationship. So the number we observe can be cast to the true number using technical noise, as well as this object, P of X, which represents the amount of RNA in the cell. And this should seem concerning because we don't know what this object is. We're trying to learn about it. So to even, um, we, we have to start by writing down some model of biology that governs P of X to figure out which part of the variability is biological and whether we can even hope to deconvolve it from the technical noise. So our goal is then to formalize the RNA biology separately from the experiment using a plausible model. And I'm gonna walk you through the fundamentals of the sort of models that have been used to ask these questions. And by building up their complexity, I hope to contextualize what people are doing now, as well as motivate what I think uh, we should be doing. All right, uh, we can start with differential equations, which are a way to formalize the idea that the amount of RNA is somehow dynamical, evolves over time, and this uh, evolution might depend on the current amount of RNA. And there is a canonical way to do this. Um, it dates back to Monod and other researchers in the 50s, and uh, kind of the simplest form of this has uh, transcription degradation. We can look at this term by term. Total rate of change in RNA has a contribution from creation and from degradation. And this gives us trajectories that look like this. We start off with a large rate of change, but then we go to equilibrium. 
And notice the shape because it'll reappear. Um, now this concept turns out to work great if we have thousands of molecules, but we, if we look at single molecule measurements, we just don't see that. The amounts of RNA are jagged. They vary with time and they don't converge to a single value, they keep changing. Somehow we need to account for this variability intrinsic to the process. So we tried a thing, it didn't work, let's try again. Um, to incorporate this variability, we need to use the machinery of stochastic process. Now we've seen something like this before when we conceptualize the randomness in the experimental process that not every single molecule is picked up. So this is quite similar, but now we also want to include randomness in a dynamics in the simplest case is the random walk. It's continuous, but it get, goes up and down in a random way. It gives us sort of jagged trajectories we want. And this is very well understood from a variety of fields, finance, physics, electrical engineering, and so on. We run it many times, we get different values. It'll spend about half the time, about half, uh, half the time above and half the time below zero. And at every time it has an associated distribution, P of epsilon, like we'd expect it's symmetrical around zero. So we have a noise process, and of course we'd like to encode everything else we know, so we write down what's called a stochastic differential equation, still representing the rate of change in RNA, production, degradation, and variability. And this turns out to look a lot more reasonable, we get the right trajectory shape, and if we look at how different trajectories evolve, it turns out they're centered around the solution to the system with no noise. Um, that's just the average level, of course, if we look at the actual P of X, it has some variability, now, this is actually called the ornstein ullenbeck process. It's used in finance. We understand its properties quite well. And we can't really use this. The model can give us values below zero, but we can't observe negative values of molecules. So somehow we need to fix this. Um, so we can go ahead and correct the stochastic differential equation by using square root dependence for the noise. Uh, same story. The amount of RNA depends on production, degradation, and noise. The trajectories look fine. They hover about the ODE average, and we're no longer going below zero, which is good. So we seemingly have a solid candidate for P of X. Um, and this is actually another finance model called the Cox and Grissel Ross model. Seems good, right? Um, wrong. The problem is we can't really compare this to the data. The data are numbers like 0, 1, 2, and 3, whereas the model gives us probabilities of numbers like 1.5 and one third. so there's a mismatch. And this difference turns out not to matter if we have something like dozens to hundreds of molecules, but it does in practice where we have usually 0, rarely more than 10. So for those of you keeping score, we can inform some of these features, but we fail to take into account the uh, very fundamental part of the data, the fact that it's discrete. To fix this, we have to account for single molecule reactions, and this turns out to be relatively straightforward. First, we write down which reactions can happen, well, still production and degradation. Then we conceptualize the system as moving between states with zero, one, two, three, etc. molecules of RNA. We endow those transitions between um, states with the correct rates, and we end up getting the correct behavior. We get trajectories that track the number of our name molecules and represent individual transcription and degradation events, um, which either increase or decrease the amount of our name. And when we look at many trajectories, it turns out the solution with no noise accurately describes their average. So now we seem to have a really compelling candidate for a biological model with uh, discrete data. And it actually turns out to match the OD and uh, CIR solutions under certain assumptions when the number of molecules is fairly high. Now to actually compute these probabilities, we use what's called the chemical master equation, which is yet another equation that keeps track of probabilities over time. Um, so it certainly looks like the chemical master equation combines all the basic properties we need, and we can go back to the problem of denoising. We have a legitimate P of X. And the key thing to notice here is that once we have a P of X, we don't seem to really need to denoise anything. We care about the biological differences. Those are already encoded in P of X. So it seems much more straightforward to just fit that using the data and accounting for noise through P of D, of course and directly exploit and analyze difference in distribution. So in sum, my perspective is that once we have a model, we can directly deal with that model and um, uh, forego uh, transforming the data.
Um, and we've written out the model, convinced ourselves that it gives reasonable results in terms of its uh, variable space, but we still don't really know how well it matches the real data. Um, and it turns out it's still not quite enough. To understand why we need to do the math, it turns out if we set up this system and solve the master equation, we get some distribution and maybe it depends on initial conditions, but at steady state it doesn't. And the steady state distribution is Poisson with variance, which is a measure of its spread, equal to the mean. If we look at real data, we don't see this. Instead, we see much higher variance across the board. So somehow we need to account for this if we are to have any hope of describing real data. We could, I suppose, use something like the negative binomial distribution instead of Poisson. It's very similar. It's not negative, it's integer valued, um, but um, it has a variance higher than the mean. Um, I got a message in the chat. I'll um, I'll answer some of these questions uh, toward the end because they'll. Uh, um, I think some of these um, um, upcoming slides will answer some of these questions. Anyway, we can use a negative binomial, sure. Um, and I'd like to pause here for a sec because this really gets us to the state of the art in the theory of sequencing. This is what people typically do in sequencing data sets. They take a data set, they uh, observe that it has properties similar to the negative binomial. It's over dispersed, it's got this high variance, it's discrete. So they fit a negative binomial or maybe transform the data in a way that's consistent with the negative binomial. But in light of everything I've just talked about, uh, the construction of models, we really should not do that. Instead, we need to first carefully think about the biology of this distribution codes. As I'm about to discuss, this turns out to matter quite a bit. And the best way to conceptualize this for me is to think about constitutive relations, which are good mathematical descriptors of what happens in physical systems, which don't quite rise to the level of physical laws. We can get these from data. If we have measurements of concentration over time, we could figure out the one-dimensional fixed law. How things diffuse in a 1D channel is governed by this equation. The power of constitutive laws really comes from providing a foundation for first principles models. Given this equation, we could propose a reasonable model with particles jumping left and right on a grid. And if we solve this model, um, then the average concentration, the average number of particles will give us this correct behavior. But once we have that first principles model, we're no longer restricted to 1D. We can define a multidimensional grid in doubt with, with precisely the same dynamics, solve the system and discover the general form. Now we'd never do this for fixed law, that's quite well understood, but the key takeaway for sequencing is that if we have a microscopic model, we can generalize constitutive relations in a principled way. There's a right way to do so. And surprisingly, something very similar can happen in sequencing. We do an experiment, we get a cell by gene matrix of mature or spliced counts. The gene distributions look negative binomial or negative binomial. So interpret the data in a typical descriptive worldview. Uh, we fit a negative binomial distribution. Now, in the mechanistic world you am advocating for, we do the exact same thing, but we motivate this distribution by a particular set of testable assumptions and by a particular model, like um, there's some kind of bursty transcription, there's transcriptional variation, and then RNA get degraded, and this gives us a negative binomial. Sure, so far we've done the exact same thing in both cases, but the difference is coming to really sharp relief if we obtain some multimodal data like nascent or unspliced counts. Still a matrix, still negative binomial. What do we do? Well, the descriptive world view does not have a prescription for this. What we usually do for single cells, throw away this data. What we do for single nucleus or the most recent version of cell rangers, add the two matrices. I suppose you could fit two negative binomials. Nobody really does this. On the other hand, the solution in the mechanistic worldview is uh, tr almost trivial and obvious. We had to define a model to motivate the negative binomial in the first place. To come up with the right distribution here, we simply have to extend the model to involve the relationship between nascent and mature RNA. And we can demonstrate this with BiVI, a neural framework I designed for the analysis of sequencing data. Um, uh, some of you might be familiar with SCBI, which is a variational autoencoder used for dimensionality reduction. And without getting too deeply into the inside baseball of uh, ML, uh, SCBI summarized the raw data matrix, and this is thousands of genes using a low dimensional representation. 
then this representation can be used as a proxy for the data set to identify cell types, clusters, so on. The idea is we pass the data through a neural network, get this representation, use another neural network to get parameters for a model likelihood that describes the RNA distribution for each cell and gene. And then we go ahead and iterate and update both of these networks by um, uh, optimizing the likelihood of the data. Um, we become fairly faithful to the original data matrix. And as I became familiar with this framework and its popularity and assumptions, I noticed that this generative model is negative binomial. So my first question was, what is the sensible way to extend this to multiple species? We can get more than one species. We can get spliced and unspliced data. How should we use SCVI with that? And my claim is that we should write down the distribution and very carefully think about the processes that can give us such a distribution. The canonical explanation in fluorescence transcriptomics is bursty transcription due to a promoter switching between states. This seems to match what we see in real data. Transcription is rare, but fairly high activity. So we get this bursting behavior. So first we write down one species model which has a negative binomial distribution. And to go from a univariate model to a bivariate one, we just uh, append a reaction representing the transformation of nascent RNA to mature RNA by splicing, and we get a bivariate distribution at steady state. So to implement our autoencoder, we use the entire result of this bivariate process as our generative model. Now we're no longer throw away, throwing away half our data or conflating the two uh, types of molecules and the model parameters actually reflect something about the physics. At least in principle, because the devil is in the details here, as I said, this is some distribution. But we do need to perform numerical integration and Fourier inversion to evaluate it, potentially over a large grid. And if you work with these processes, this should seem impossible. Uh, we should not be able to use this generative model, just like we shouldn't be able to do automatic differentiation on finite state projection or such. My key insight here was um, the proposal that it is possible. We just need a good function approximator, and we know that neural networks are good function approximators. We really just need to constrain and transform a neural network to give distributions of the correct shape, so get 90% of the way there and training will take care of the details. Now, here I came up with a basic design. We take advantage of the fact that the nascent marginal is negative binomial, then use a neural network to predict the parameters for the conditional distribution. Um, so to actually implement this, I created a biophysics subgroup in the lab and made this the rotation project for junior student and subgroup, Maria. This is available. You can read this uh, preprint. Very excited about this. Um, but we can actually revisit the figure I showed a few slides back and delve deeper into these assumptions because distributions could be negative binomial for other reasons than bursting. For example, the rate of transcription might exhibit some variability between cells, and if this variability is gamma distributed, we'll get the exact same negative binomial distribution. And then we can use the same thought process to ask, well, this is a pretty canonical model, but why should this variation be gamma? What is, like, how should we explain this? And by using kind of the same thought process, we found it's the slow limit of several possible biological models. Actually, the CIR model, the mathematical form is precisely the finance model I described earlier. But once we've defined these models, we don't have to stick to that indistinguishable limit. It turns out they are generally distinguishable from each other just based on count data. And curiously enough, one of them gives us the burst yield limit yet again. So in other words, it really stresses that the choice of distribution is not arbitrary. It encodes specific mechanisms about the sources, as well as the mechanisms of variability. And we can distinguish them based on data available right now, and we can better distinguish them by using multimodal data. Ultimately, the takeaway for day-to-day um, -day analysis is this. We want to describe multimodal data like nascent and mature molecules. And the bursty model is a good candidate. It's precedent. It can arise from multiple microscopic mechanisms. So we can more or less summarize a data set by fitting this relatively simple model with three parameters. I developed a tool for this. It's called Mano, named for one of the originators of quantitative biology. And... Um, now that we have this foundation, we can revisit technical noise. And it turns out that just as in the case with base theorem I discussed earlier, 
we really want to know something about the biology to say something about technical variability. These things are not mutually identifiable. So every 10x data set I've ever seen shows a length bias in nascent RNA. Um, longer genes have more nascent RNA observations in a variety of tissues at a variety of levels of stratification. If we try to fit the model on a previous slide, we get seemingly reasonable results, but we predict that longer genes have higher birth sizes, which actually contradicts the known literature. So this really seems to be a technical effect. We can explain it better by proposing a length by sequencing capture rate for long nascent RNA because they have a lot of primer handles for sequencing. And we get better results, but we wouldn't have known this first without fitting the we wouldn't have known this without first fitting the wrong model and then interpreting the results into the context of known biology. So to describe these data sets more faithfully, we actually need to add on some more technical noise terms, so the rates of actually sequencing molecules. And this performs quite well. This is one of the key results of my PhD, um, a toolbox for answer, answering quantitative questions about biological and technical variability in sequencing data sets. Now, this toolbox is more than um, kind of the software or um, a kind of conceptual framework for doing de novo analyses. It also provides a principled baseline for workflows in general. This is important because common analyses can give contradictory results or be tied to arbitrary hyperparameter choice. Um, the motivation for a lot of my work was RNA velocity, which attempts to, do, to use uh, nascent and mature RNA data to do unsupervised trajectory identification. Sometimes this works. So here we've got four brain development trajectory from the original RNA velocity paper. This is correct, but sometimes different packages fail catastrophically. Here we're looking at the exact same data, um, different implementation, and it reverses part of the trajectory and tells a completely different story. So using physical approaches, we can ask questions like, why does this work? Why does it fail sometimes? Uh, generate synthetic data as well as try to understand the workflows and see where they might violate physical assumptions. And now that we've separated the technical from the biological, we can actually go back to base theorem again, um, look at the denoising transformations and try to really understand what they do. Well, they try to remove technical noise. They try to remove incidental technical variability so they shouldn't touch the biological. We don't know how much of the variability in the data set is biological and how much is technical, but we do know that under mild assumptions, the biological has to be at least as high as the variance of the means in different cell types. So there is a meaningful lower limit. And if a transformation takes the data set below the submissible envelope until it throws out too much of the inf too much information, um, it turns out a lot of the standard transformations do um, throughout these biological differences, which means they're not as efficient as they could be. Another kind of biophysical approach does not really have that problem. Now, this relies on having some cell type annotations. Um, and we don't typically have that, but a collaborator in the subgroup, Tara, has worked on leveraging Minolta cluster de novo, and it seems to be working fairly well. Um, and this clustering takes place in biophysical parameters, and that brings us to the really exciting prospect. Once we've defined and fit the model, we can exploit these parameters, these numbers, to individually consider the biological and technical differences between data sets. And this is strictly more powerful than just looking at um, average expression, because some of these parameters might change while keeping the average expression constant. Maybe there's higher efficiency in sequencing, but lower expression in the cell, and we really need a physical model to deconvolve these effects. So for instance, we can look at replicates, compare the parameters we obtain, and ascribe the differences to specific biophysical effects. So here we're looking at matched data sets uh, from single cell and single nucleus technology after accounting for technical variability. And it turns out the single nucleus data set has a much lower mature RNA lifetime, whereas other parameters look roughly the same. And maybe that's reasonable to explain by rapid export from the nucleus. Um, I, I, I could believe that. Uh, but that's a simple quantitative result. Its implications are actually quite profound. By doing this, we have, in a way, integrated single cell and single nucleus data. We've put them on the same footing. This is a challenging problem with no well-defined solution. By having a model, we can say things like, 
Single cell and single nucleus data should look the same at the level of nascent RNA, but they don't have to at the level of mature RNA. And this gives us a principled way to compare them and learn about their differences. And like I said, there might be cases where parameters compensate each other's values to give roughly the same expression, and we really see this in real data. Typically, we distinguish, let's say, different types of neurons by markers which have higher expression or in one or another cell type, but there are actually genes that have roughly the same expression but much higher noise in one or another cell type as though they're pseudo-markers. They're on the diagonal line in the leftmost plot. Um, and these are real distributional differences that don't amount to a significant difference in the average, as you can see in the middle. Now, these are a handful of genes. We can find them, we can describe them, and they seem interesting and related to the neuron's function. But in some systems, like the one on the right, we see something even more interesting. When we add a particular perturbation that induces DNA damage, noise increases across the board. Um, so this is a meaningful biological control motif, and it demonstrates that just looking at averages is not enough. We need to understand the distributions to fully um, uh, fully understand them and exploit these data sets. So what have we seen so far in practice? Well, we can set up some models with two species, which is good because that's the kind of data we can readily obtain. Um, we can include some simple treatments of technical variation and even look at some um, models of transcriptional noise that go into a little bit more detail. The crux of my theoretical work has been how generic can we make this while keeping this problem still tractable? And it turns out we can go very generic. And first, we write down a very gen general formulation of the physics with promoter switching, downstream processing, translation, and so on. We can also account for some RNA velocity style transient phenomena. Then we write down a very general formulation of technical noise. We've already seen part of this, but um, we would typically also like to account for noise in microfluidics, encapsulation, background molecules, and so on. Next, we write down the generating function for each independent part of the system and essentially compose and integrate them. This gives us the generating function for the entire system. So this is how it looks quantitatively. Uh, we have a system of ordinary differential equations, which are uh, which depend on this uh, function bold-faced u, which is itself the solution to some differential equations with the initial condition that um, encodes molecule level technical noise, like the level of dropout. And once we've solved the equation at the very top, we can include barcode technical noise and transient phenomena. Now, this isn't uh, just um, uh, from nowhere. This is actually the result and um, uh, kind of a um, numerically tractable version of this partial differential equation which is in turn isomorphic to the master equations, just its Laplace or Z transform. So we can look at a term by term. J is a Jacobian, C is the matrix that includes linear terms, like uh, what molecules do once they've been produced, like degradation and uh, splicing. D is a um, matrix with nonlinear terms, like catalysis, and the operator H includes state switching and RNA production, everything that happens at the gene locus. We're operating at an extreme level of generality. Every single thing I mentioned so far can be seen as a special case, and it turns out that once we're looking at that partial differential equation, the distinction between continuous and discrete process becomes a lot more blurred. It's so general, we can recycle results from other quantitative fields like finance. And this is something I'm tremendously excited about because we've only really begun to scratch the surface of these connections. For example, it turns out that in a very precise and quantitative way, the CIR interest rate model is equivalent to autocatalysis. Now, autocatalysis is uh, essentially the model we've already described, but now each molecule can also copy itself. And it gives trajectories that look like this, and it's governed by this partial differential equation. But I don't want to solve this. Instead, we can go back to the Cox and Versal Ross or CIR interest rate model. It looks like this and gives familiar trajectories and a partial differential equation that looks like this. The terms have the exact same functional form, which means the solutions have to be very closely related. And they are, we can solve the system on the left just by using the known solution of the one on the right. In other words, even though some of these mathematical problems are challenging, they're 
known in other fields. It's just a matter of recognizing and exploiting these connections. Although this is very general, there's still a fair number of limitations. We can't really do explicit regulation like feedback yet. The math becomes very difficult and it's challenging to even write down uh, kind of a general form of this. We can't even solve these things numerically. It's also not totally clear what level the technical noise model should be at. Um, the ones I've been using work fairly well, but a lot of future work is necessary because simplifications have to be made. Um, so to summarize kind of the broad themes of all of this, if we have a stochastic model, we can ask questions in a principled way and analyze genome-wide data, and this could take a lot of different forms. You can see all the figures and variants of this on the right from various published papers. This could mean making a bottom-up model that starts from first principles and tries to uh, describe biology, but it could also mean making a hybrid model where we have a black box, some neural function, and then we force it to um, meet the assumptions and axioms of physics in some way. Or it could mean doing workflow evaluation, building um, statistically founded simulations and criteria for good or bad performance of an existing heuristic workflow. The flip side of this is that if we do not have a stochastic model, the conclusions we draw can be wrong in ways that prevent us from building on them. So um, I'd love to thank my collaborators at uh, Caltech, Harvard Medical, and uh, UC Davis. Um, I actually completed my postdoc in September, so I'm currently looking for work in industry. If you all have any suggestions, I'd love it if you reached out. My LinkedIn and my portfolio website is on the slide. And yeah, I'd love to take any questions. Thank you so much.